Okay, um, back to the second part of this talk. We have one hour left, um, and as I um, announced, I'd like to spend it to uh, introduce you to the three main orientations. <coughs> question of the uh, foundation of human rights. So I told you I want to focus on the many of the many uh, different philosophical questions you may have about you may have about human rights. <coughs> the one we are going to focus in this course is the question of the justification. Okay. Um, um, there are many ways in which you can organize the philosophical literature about this specific question. Uh, one way is the one that was proposed by Fagan in 2011. He distinguishes mainly two perspectives <coughs> that he calls the interest theory approach and the, the choice approach. The former insists that the best argument to ground human rights rests on the interest that each human being has in the protection offered by human rights. So individuals necessarily have uh, uh, an interest in human rights because certain fundamental features of human nature bind them to care about human rights. You cannot say that human rights are not obligatory <coughs> or have no or normative force because they protect uh, values and goods <coughs> you are of necessity interested in your life, your freedom, uh, your freedom to choose the kind of life you want to lead and so on and so forth. That would be the interest approach. The second approach uh, does not commit itself to a view of humans' fundamental interests uh, and thereby it avoids a commitment to a view of human nature which may be problematic from, from a philosophical point of view uh, and instead it insists on the idea that uh, humans necessarily care about the freedom to choose what things are of interest for them. So that's why it's called the choice theory approach. I mean, what human rights are about is to protect the freedom not to have certain goods, specific goods, but to have the freedom to decide what counts as something that is important for you. Um, now, For many reasons, uh, this bipartition that Fagan proposes does not seem to capture the real divide among uh, the human rights theoreticians. In fact, it seems that both the interest approach and the choice approach share the intuition that human rights are grounded because they protect something that is considered as important for us. In the first case, are this something is um, certain basic objective goods uh, that are defined as important for us because of our human nature and in the second case uh, the freedom to decide what is our nature so to speak and therefore what are the things that are important for us but in both cases you have an interest approach in a sense. human rights are important because you have an interest in something. So in the end, the, the division is not that sharp because both categories share this intuition that if you want to ground human rights, you have to look at what people care about, about what the interest of human beings. Now a different, and I think more interesting way of organizing the different orientations in the philosophy of human rights has been recently proposed by John Tassoulas. Tassoulas, in 2012, distinguishes three main answers to the question uh, 
uh, of what is the nature of human rights uh, and these questions are the reductive view, the orthodox view and the political view. Now, although the question of the what is the nature of human rights is not identical with the question of what is the foundation of human rights, uh, this tripartition, reductive, orthodox and political view um, can be also used as a useful guide to the most influential attempts to answer the justification problem. Now, the reductive view is like in Fagan, uh, interest approach, that is the view that the reasons why human rights should be taken seriously, the reason why they have obligatory force, is that they protect basic human interests. It's a reductive view because the normativity of human rights is reductive, is reduced to the interest that human rights protect. Human rights are binding because, and to the extent in which the goods they protect are desirable for human beings. Now, quite to the opposite, the orthodox view <coughs> makes no reference to our interests. Um, and the point of the orthodox is to say that human rights are moral rights possessed by all human beings, as the famous phrase has it, in virtue of their humanity. I mean, I'm sure that the first thing you know about human rights, ah, these are those rights we have in virtue of our humanity. So the orthodox wants to make a lot out of this idea that we have these rights in virtue of the fact that we are human beings, because that's what in virtue of humanity Needs. And of course, the orthodox view uh, is committed to explain what is within this concept of humanity that explains why we have these rights. So the, the business, the foundational business in the orthodox perspective is to find in the notion of humanity something that explains why we have rights that, for example, cats, dogs, monkeys do not have. So what, what is it within our humanity that entitles us to these special protections? The third view is the political view, and the political view, as I was telling to your colleague, uh, holds that one can be non-committal to uh, the normative force contained uh, in uh, the notion of humanity. I mean, one can be non-committal about the issue whether human rights map on some moral rights that are justified independently of uh, uh, consideration about human rights. And uh, the political view says that human rights are justified simply because of the function that have come to perform in uh, contemporary politics. And that function is mainly the limitation of national, legitimate national sovereignty of state or state-like institutions. So, reductive, orthodox political view on uh, uh, the normativity of human rights. Now, this justification problem is so acutely felt among philosophers that only two years ago, almost three years ago now, um, there is a, a, a huge book came out by Oxford University Press called Philosophical Foundation of Human Rights, the one I showed to you. Um, a huge meaning, 500 pages all devoted to uh, this problem of the justification of human rights. And uh, here the editors of the book uh, propose a tripartition that pretty much maps on the tripartition by the Zibulas. Uh, the, 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 the terminology is different but the concepts seem to be pretty much the same. Now, we have here uh, 
that the reductive view becomes the um, instrumental justification, the orthodox becomes the non-instrumental justification, and the political view becomes the practice-based view. Uh, now, what is interesting about this book of, uh, of 2015 is not the change of terminology, of course, but the way in which people argue in favor one of these three options. Let's try to have an overview of the main arguments given within each of these three different approaches. And perhaps I will finish by telling you why I think that none of these three approaches are quite convincing to me at least, that none of them independently of the variation within each approach seem to convey a convincing foundation of human rights. Okay, instrumentalist, let's call it this way, so productive or instrumentalist view. Think of human rights, as we said, as useful means to realize certain features of human lives that are taken as self-evidently valuable or worthy of protection. When it comes to specifying what are these features, three different art answers are usually given. The first kind of answer that is proposed within this instrumentalist slash productive approach uh, is to say that it's agency, the feature that human rights protect and in which we have necessarily an interest. Agency, the capacity to act on self-chosen ends, is both something that humans tend to value highly and something that distinguishes us from other animal species, at least in terms of degree. We are self-determining entities, we think at least, more than other uh, animal species. We are in charge of our lives more because we are rational creatures more than other uh, animal species. Um, Griffin, for example, who is the most authoritative uh, representative of this approach, thinks that human rights protect human dignity by affording humans the means necessary to exercise their capacity for agency. Now, one of the difficulties that this approach based on agency uh, encounters is the following. Um, this problem was already noticed within a different debate in 1984 by philosopher De Dento uh, in his critique of a similar foundation of human rights proposed back then by G. Weir. Now, if you, if you say that human rights are important or obligatory because they protect agency, you immediately, I think we discussed that also in the workshop uh, I was telling you, uh, I mean we had in January, if you say that human rights are important because they protect agency, you end up with the problem with saying that even uh, a slave has his or her human rights protected because even a slave is uh, an entity with agency. Uh, of course, the freedom of uh, expression movement and many other freedoms of a slave are uh, compressed uh, by his or her condition of slavery, but that doesn't make him uh, ipso facto uh, an agent deprived of the ability to act on self-imposed ends. Uh, you can still have your thoughts, you are free to think this or that, um, you know, within yourself you are free to move in this direction or in this other direction, so it's impossible to say that his slave is deprived of agency. 
So, since clearly slavery is one of the least controversial examples of human rights violation, you cannot make agency the ground of human rights. Uh, now, Griffin might say, and in fact he says, that by agency he means more than the freedom of action that is reserved to a slave. Uh, so it means more than the minimum education and resources that slaves have. But then he has the problem that setting in a not arbitrary way the threshold below which uh, his conception of agency is not respected becomes a difficult business. So if you say, okay, by, by agency I don't mean the, th the things you still have even when you are a slave, I mean more than that, then you have a problem of saying how much goods you are supposed to be given in order to be considered as an individual endowed with agency in the richer notion that Griffin, Griffin wants. I mean, human rights are not rights to a good life. There is a fairly strong and widespread consensus that human rights do not guarantee a good life. They avoid, as we were saying before, a very bad one. So it's very difficult to list uh, a number of goods that you need to have in order for your life not to be too bad. So give Griffin have this threshold problem. Uh, another problem with the agency-based approach, um, which is one of the approaches within this instrumental view, uh, is that when we think that torture violates human rights, we don't think that the wrong done to the victim has exclusively and perhaps even primarily to do with the deprivation of her agency. So when we say it's wrong to torture someone, we don't think intuitively that the wrong that is done to the victim of torture is that we are depriving that guy of his or her uh, freedom of agency. The problem with torture is pain, uh, the pain that we are inflicting on that guy. And this is not captured by an exclusive focus on uh, agency. Finally, another problem of the agency-based account seems to be that, I mean, that's a problem on, that usually you hear also uh, about Kantian morality. Um, it seems that if agency is all that counts for human rights, you end up with the bizarre conclusion that children or mentally impaired people are not entitled to human rights, simply because they're not capable of agency in the sense in which it is described. Since the capacity for purposive action is either not yet developed like in children or permanently lost, uh, as it with severely uh, disabled uh, people, it seems to follow that, we, that they do not have human rights. I mean, if human rights are supposed to protect agency and these people, by definition, do not have an agency, it follows that they have no human rights, which would be a fairly counterintuitive conclusion, because of course morality and law attributes human rights to both children and uh, uh, mentally disabled people. Okay, so the agency version of the instrumentalist view has this kind of problems. Another instrumentalist account suggests that not just one good agency, but a plurality of goods uh, lies at the foundation of human rights. For example, John Finnis, already in 1980, suggests an allegedly objective list of human goods such as life, knowledge, play, aesthetic experience, sociability, friendship, practical reasonableness, religion. Uh, this is a list of objective goods uh, that he has. 
and on his account human rights are justified to the extent in which they further these goods. Similarly, James Nigel, the guy from which I was giving the introduction before, adopts a pluralist perspective and argues that human rights secure mainly four goods, life, the steering of one life, so the ability to decide which direction your life is supposed to take, avoidance of cruel and degrading treatment, and avoidance of severely unfair treatment. Now, the difference between the last two is that in the first case you avoid uh, cruelty or degrading um, uh, things that may happen to you, so basically pain, physical pain. Uh, in the second case you avoid uh, severe form of unfairness that not, not necessarily have to do with pain, such as you are discriminated in a trial, your testimony is given one-third the, the weight of uh, another person simply because you are a woman, because uh, you are not part of the religious majority. I don't know, this kind of unfairness, severe discriminations among Um, the editors of this interesting book on the Philosophical Foundation of Human Rights include in the instrumentals, instrumentalist family um, also the position of John Tassiulas, who is often considered more of an orthodox, but with reason. Because Tassiulas expands the list of goods protected to a sort of indeterminate and open-ended list of things that benefit humans. Uh, with the sole constraint, so how do you make the list not infinite, uh, the constraint is that um, there is a human right to X only if X does not impose excessive burdens on corresponding duty bearers. So there can be a human right to happiness or to have a Ferrari uh, or to have a, a luxury villa uh, for everybody because this would impose on everybody too much of a burden uh, intuitively that's the idea but other than that I mean one of the interesting features of this approach is that you know if there are social ways that are not too burdensome for the society to organize work life in such a way that everybody has fun in doing the work that he, he or she does there should be a, a human right to have fun uh, when you work. So anything that can be socially organized and in which people have an interest in, in on Tassiula's approach becomes a human right that, to that thing. Um, now, the approach of Tassiula's uh, is not limited to a consideration of human interests because he thinks that any uh, approach to the normativity of human rights cannot do without the notion of human dignity. So far, as you have noticed, we made no reference to human dignity, to humanity. We are talking about interests that humans have. If humans could be the worst species on earth, the least decent species and still according to the, the instrumentalist view, they would have human rights because, you know, they, they, it's a protection of their interest. If they are badass, it doesn't really matter. So, so far there was no interest in human dignity or talking, talk along these lines. Now, Tassoulas is not among this, uh, among the people who think that we can do without any reference to human dignity. Unfortunately, he doesn't explain, one, why we have human dignity, and two, how human dignity enters the picture in this justificatory business. He simply says, don't think that we can make reference to interest only. Okay. Now, both pillars on which, I mean, interest on the one hand and humanity, and human dignity on the other hand in Casulas, both these pillars of his foundation rest on, uh, in my opinion at least, uh, are quite unstable. 
So regarding the first, when it comes to, as I said, when it comes to explain the intrinsically valuable status humans have, not to mention their equal status, uh, all we are given by Dasyulas is a list of the features that contribute to what he calls a non-metaphysical, ch changing definition of human nature. So the ontological basis of this human dignity is that we are characterized by capacities for language use, for registering a diverse range of normative considerations, including the evaluative considerations of potential, moral, aesthetic, uh, or, or other sorts, and for aligning, and keep quoting, one's judgment, emotions, and actions with these considerations, end of quote. So, we are given this hint to our the ontological basis. We are creatures that are capable of language, of response to a situation in which we have to evaluate conflicting interests of the people involved. I think that's what Tasula means in this rather heavy language that he uses. Um, but um, this seems to me to thin of an ontological basis to explain why we have dignity. Yes, we, we are capable of language, so monkeys are. We are capable of uh, some moral evaluation of the situations we are in by itself. This could be done also by other species, and it is done, as many of the logical, uh, 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 ethological studies have shown. Um, it, it's not clear why this establishes any dignity for the human species, not to mention any special dignity compared to other species. Um, now, A similar foundation, similar to the one on, uh, of uh, John Tassiulas, who simply uh, puts together the instrumentalist intuition that you need to make reference to the interest of human beings if you want to explain the normativity of human rights with this reference to human dignity. Um, a similar foundation to this is that proposed by Henry Shu in 1997 and then by David Miller in 2012. Well, they argue that there is a set of basic needs all humans have, independently of their conception of the good life. Needs for food, water, air, but also a minimal degree of social interaction and recognition are, you know, the first goods that come to mind. Now, while this approach avoid the under-inclusion of the agency-based approach. So the problem uh, that we saw with the agency-based approach that you know, doesn't look like human rights protect only our ability to act, because the reason why torture is bad according to human rights standard is really the suffering that goes on uh, with, with torture. So this pluralistic approach by Gasiulas, Shu, Nihil, and, and the others I have mentioned avoid the problem of the agency-based uh, approach. But I think it still faces at least two main problems. On the one hand, uh, the determination of the golden mean seems to be quite arbitrary, so the threshold problem that I was mentioning before, if you have a rich notion of rich and articulated um, account of the goods that humans need, then uh, it, it gets tricky to decide, you know, you need that much, not more, not less, it, the, determining the, the right threshold becomes a problem. Um, and secondly, that's the second problem with this pluralistic approach, quintessential, non-controversial human rights such as civil and political rights can be traced back to human needs only with some stretch. I mean, what 
need or interest uh, does the freedom of association really protect? Or the freedom to protest against my government? Yes, of course, there, there is an interest in uh, um, you know, defending yourself through an association by political uh, decisions that you don't like. You have an interest in opposing certain laws that uh, do not uh, fulfill your needs or something like that. But we think that there is something more about uh, civil and political rights especially that have to do with the protection of the status of citizenship, quite independently of the interest that you have in uh, exercising your civil and political rights. I mean, there is a problem of if the state does not allow me to participate in any possible form in the determination of political decisions, there is a mistreatment that has to do with uh, the way in which I am treated as a child, more than as someone who can participate in making political decisions. And this is really difficult to trace down to an interest that is not taken into account. It looks like more a question of status. It looks like a question of how the institutions treat you. Okay, the last approach within this instrumentalist school I want to mention is perhaps the most famous one uh, by Amartya Sen and Martha Nussbaum. They suggest a direct link between human rights and uh, not interest in this case, but as you know, capabilities. So, capabilities are real opportunities for individuals to realize their life plan. So notice, it's interestingly something halfway between a focus on interest and a focus on choice. The division of Fagan, the choice approach, the interest approach. Capabilities are in, in between. They are real opportunities to lead the life that you choose. So, on the one hand, uh, there is a protection of objective things that you need in such a way that you can, you know, make the life that you choose as the best life for you. That's pretty much what capabilities are. And not just abstract freedoms, they are things that the state needs to provide to you in such a way that you can exercise your freedom. So in this sense, real opportunities. Nussbaum uh, famously lists 10 basic human capabilities life, bodily health and integrity, senses, imagination and thought, emotions, practical reason, affiliation, relations to other species, relation to other species, play and control over one's environment. And things that all human beings are entitled to these things as a matter of human rights. Now, one problem this approach shares with the other instrumentalist positions that we have seen so far is quite simply the conflation between uh, what we need or what we have an interest in and uh, what we have a right to. That here is Joseph Russ' famous point against instrumentalist accounts. Russ famously says that if something is very important for me, let's imagine that we have an objective list of human interests, things that we really all care about, independently of the difference we may have about the conception of the human life, the conception of what is good, and so on and so forth. Let's imagine that we can have a list of objective goods that all human beings need. This is still, perhaps, rightly points out, still very far from having a list of human rights, because what you have an interest in is not ipso facto something you have a right to. Pras' famous example is that everybody is very interested in being loved or having someone who loves you, but that doesn't give you a right to be loved. So there is a gap between what you have an interest in, even if you are objectively 
uh, entitled to say it is my human I mean, interest to be loved how can you live without being loved but we wouldn't make at least the legal right that says unless the, you know we, we have to find some other citizen that loves you <laughs> if you have nobody we have to make a social scheme that you know make sure that you are loved because clearly you have an interest in being loved so most cases uh, in general I mean it is one thing to have an interest in something and it is a different thing to have a right to that something right? okay so I think that this last problem uh, teaches the general lesson uh, that the real problem expresses the real problem in all the instrument instrumentalist perspective this conflation between good and right this conflation between things you have an interest in and things you have a right to it's not sufficient to show that human beings need something to show that we should have a list of rights to those things humans have an interest in. Um, the most that the instrumentalist group can do is to show that since we are all interested in these goods, we cannot uh, rationally say that we are not interested in the things that protect our access to those things, which would be rights. But this is still very different from saying that you have grounded normativity of these rights. Because in order to show that we are truly entitled to these rights, you need to show me why the interests of human beings in the first place have some importance for, from the point of view of morality. I don't know if you see this point. It's not enough, I, I repeat it because it's the, it's the, the main point against the instrumentalist approach. The most that the instrumentalist approach manages to do is to show that it's rationally inconsistent to say that each human being is not interested in human rights. If we grant the premise that human rights protect goods that we necessarily have an interest in, we cannot rationally say that we don't care about human rights because it is as if we were saying we don't care uh, about the goods that we have decided we certainly care about. So there is a, an inconsistency there. But this is still different from saying that we are entitled to these things we have decided and we know we are necessarily interested in. It could be that yes, we have certainly an interest in these things, but we are such a bad species, such, you know, we are a species made of such a bad people and individuals that, you know, we don't have any right to uh, physical integrity or, uh, you know, the, the, the possibility to choose one's life and so on and so forth. Okay, that ends what I wanted to say about instrumentalist justification. I don't know if I'll be able to go over three of the, all three of them. If not, I'll, I will say something about them uh, tomorrow. The non-instrumentalist uh, approach, the second of the three orientations I am presenting, uh, of course, uh, says the opposite <laughs> than uh, instrumentalism. Uh, non-instrumentalism relies on the intrinsic worth human beings supposedly have, so no reference to interest, reference to dignity, reference to uh, a worth that humans, we think, have, um, and uh, tries to show the normativity of human rights with reference to this uh, intrinsic worth. So the point of human rights is not that of protecting the interest of humans, but of protecting a status that humans possess. It is in virtue of this status that the interest we may have as humans acquire some normative force. Uh, one representative of this approach is Kant, 
that says fundamental human rights are not concerned with protecting a person's interests, but with expressing his nature as a being of a certain sort, one whose interests are worth protecting, to the point I was making before. You still have to show me why my interests are worth protecting, why should morality be concerned with protecting my interests. Thomas Nagel, who is considered also, you know, a representative of this approach, endorses, endorses this intuition by Cam about persons' inv inviolability as the basic ground of human rights. He does not think it necessary, though, to justify this inviolable status. And he stops any further inquiry into the nature of this status that entitles us to human rights by arguing in this way. Any attempt to render more intelligible a fundamental moral idea will inevitably consist in looking at the same things in a different way rather than in deriving it from another idea which seems at the outset completely independent. So, Hegel is saying there must be a, a point at which your foundational gain stops because it's not the case that you can be, you know, be going deeper and deeper uh, indefinitely. So, if you refer to, to the status that human beings have, this seems to be Nagel's reasoning, you have to assume that people understand that humans have this certain status and that there is no need to explain why human beings have this special status, why they have an intrinsic worth. So it looks like an appeal to intuitions. I mean, yeah, I mean, we all know that human beings are special beings and that for this reason they are entitled to a protection of their interests. Similarly, Dworkin thinks that human rights should be conceived as protecting human dignity. Um, the fundamental human right in general, uh, Dworkin thinks, is the right to be treated with a certain attitude, an attitude that expresses the understanding that each person is a human being whose dignity matters. Okay, Buchanan, who is another very influential theoretician of human rights, also thinks that human rights cannot be grounded by appealing only to the goods that they secure and protect. And he argues in favor of uh, this conclusion by using a rather illuminating example. So he gives an example that, if necessary, explains uh, that you cannot do justice to human rights if you focus exclusively on interests that humans have. What is Buchanan's example? Let's imagine a, f a female top manager, a female top executive, so a woman who, you know, is the head of uh, multinationals, makes a lot of money, she is very successful. Um, and she's paid uh, for this Abigail role. Let's further imagine that for the same job she's paid slightly less than a male top manager, top executive. And merely because she's a woman. I mean, there, there is an established practice in the society that women are paid uh, 10% less than, uh, than, than men, as it often happens, as you know. Um, but we're talking about that one makes uh, 1 million euros per year and the other one makes 900,000 euros per year. So we're not talking about, you know, bad lives. So Buchanan says, in this case, we would, our intuition show that we, we have a human right violation here because this woman is discriminated simply in virtue of the fact that she's a woman. But it's difficult to say that the problem here is that her interests are not taken into account because with 900,000 euros per year, I mean, you can fulfill your needs quite efficiently. 
right? So what seems to be at stake is the question of this respect of the status that we all share and an equal status that we all share, right? Um, so this example is important because it shows one more time that it's difficult to s s take away all consideration about dignity, about status, about equal status among human beings and focus exclusively on the interests that humans have. Um, now, uh, the three editors of uh, this book uh, that I was mentioning before, Philosophical Foundation of Human Rights, think that the adoption of non-instrumentalism, so if you if you adopt non-instrumentalism, does not imply the rejection of the idea that human rights are grounded on a plurality of goods that they project. So this, you know, two double approach that we have seen already with Tassiulas. So on the one hand, you focus on human dignity and you realize that you cannot do without a reference to human dignity and status. But on the other hand, you also focus on the interest that humans have because a reference to the interest is important. Otherwise, you would have only a human right to have an equal status protected. I mean, you would not get to the things that human rights usually protect. So. Uh, free trial, uh, I mean, fair trial, uh, physical integrity, 